here's how we need to kind of start on this, and that is that all of us have within our lives a type of church culture. Every single one of us have a church culture and, and on an individual level. And what I mean is that all of us have a expectation of what church should be like an expectation of what we should expect when we attend church, and we all have expectations and ideas of what should be appropriate or inappropriate within a church. And it's interesting that we all have that, because whenever somebody does something offensively or inappropriate in a church, even the atheists and non-Christians go, that shouldn't be talked about in a church. And it's like, even though they don't go, they still have a concept of church culture. So what we can do is we can kind of reflect in our own minds to ourselves of what our church culture is. I don't mean church culture like here we are as a congregation, but individually what you expect. For example, just think back to your first ever church experience. And what tends to happen is your first ever church experience or how you were raised in church tends to be that standard for your church culture. It tends to be. Not always. I know for, for some people, they had a horrible first experience. And so what they end up doing is they start looking for churches that are not that experience. Or they had a wonderful church experience. And for them, that is how it should be. And they start looking at other churches and other cities or whatever for that experience again. And they, they have that first experience. So for example, we might say that maybe your first church experience and how you were raised in church was a decaf church. So all the singing was done with hands to the side. Right? And everyone just kind of just sung. You know? And that's just maybe how you were raised and what you expect. And then one day you attend another church after you move or someone from a different church experience that wasn't decaf. They were a more caffeinated type of a church. And so therefore they might sing with one hand up or maybe with both hands up, maybe with a little bit of clapping. And at that point you might get uncomfortable. You might look around and see people going, oh yeah, you know, and, and, and you're just like, I'm not so sure <clears throat> about this. Or if somebody visits and you're like, you're all about decaf and they're all about caffeinated, right? And they're, they're getting all kind of happy and excited and you're just like, yeah, you came to the wrong church. You want the one up the street. Uh, and, and, or we start getting upset in our minds. Could it be that, that we're wrong, that it shouldn't be decaf, it should be caffeinated and maybe that's the way it should be and maybe, maybe, maybe we should raise a hand or two. You know, that's something maybe we ought to pray about here at Anchor. Um, but <laughs> nonetheless, it's, it's, that's that church culture, okay? That's the culture that I'm talking about, that we have based upon our original experiences. So for some of us, the issue of healings, the moving of the spirit, the idea of tongues, it's gonna bring up automatically uncomfortable or comfortable feelings. Either we're going to have thoughts of excitement, yes, finally, we're going to get to the awesome stuff about the Holy Spirit and God, and we just get all excited. Or some of us, it's like, John better stay true to the denominational point of view here, because I'm getting nervous if he's talking about decaf and caffeinated. It sounds like he's more leaning one direction than the other with those phrases. I don't feel very appreciative about that. And, 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 and if I start, even maybe next week, I'm not going. You're doing a whole week just on tongues. I'm not going. I, I, he, I might find me a new church. I don't, you know, and, and who knows what you're going to have go through your mind. But I will say this, that there is just something about Miracles, the power of the Spirit, the intervening of God that impacts everyone in one way or another. Okay, it impacts everyone in one way or another. You just cannot be unaffected by it at all. Kind of like if I were to take something like this. Okay, and this is just one of those fun little toys that I collect along my days of immaturity. <laughs> it's nice to see me regress, isn't it? <laughs> okay, and you know, with something like this, you can take your got some nice little carrots here, and you know, you you put these in the middle here, and the the Bible calls or yeah, the Bible calls itself, and God calls the Bible what type of instrument? It's like a sword. Okay, like, like a double-edged sword. Something that when the, whole, when the Bible impacts your life, when the Spirit uses the Bible to impact your life, it cuts and you are always affected by it. 
right? You're always going to be impacted by it in one way or another. And so, if I were to put these in here again, this is just kind of how the Bible, I see already people are like, really? <laughs> really? You're going you're gonna to do this? You know, and so, oh. how you doing? <laughs> you know, it's just one of those, one of those things to where uh, it leaves you always affected in one way or another. Because now, having done that, your mind's going one of two places. Either I know exactly how that works, or I have an idea, and you're trying to rationalize it in your head, and you're trying to make excuses, or you're going, oh my gosh, that was gross. I can't believe he did that. I hope he never does that again. Oh my gosh, that was horrible. I have no idea. That just freaks me out, okay? Or you know, whatever, they, or you might be going, man, that's the awesomest pastor ever. His arm, the blade, it was, that was so cool, okay? And that, whatever the case may be, okay, it's going to be based upon whether this uh, concept of miracle freaks you out or you become a total skeptic about it. And what tends to happen is we bring those attitudes into the church, one way or the other. Either you're going to come into the church and you're going to be skeptical about it, so if someone says that they were ill and suddenly they weren't and the doctors can't explain it, God must have intervened, you might be like, yeah, that's called remission. Or yeah, that's called the body did this or your immune system did that. And we start trying to, out of skepticism, explain it away. Meanwhile, other people, they try to see miracles in absolutely everything. I woke up in the morning, made myself some oatmeal, and I looked into it and it was a picture of a chicken. And I knew that meant I was supposed to run for House of Representatives. I just knew that's what it meant. And, and, and they're just looking for a miracle in absolutely everything. <laughs> okay so which side are you at if you had to kind of put yourself on that spectrum do you lean toward anticipating and looking for miracles or do you lean toward skepticism regarding miracles either way you go that's your presupposition that's where you're starting and what i'm wanting to do is i'm wanting to try it as best as i can I know it's just shy of impossible because we all have our presuppositions. That which we presuppose to be true, that's what we've been raised with and based upon our whole lives upon, we have these starting points. So we always come at it subjectively with those pre-anticipations. But I want to do the best I can to step back from those and look at Scripture. See what Scripture says. Try to cut straight the difference between descriptive and prescriptive. At what point is the Bible just describing an event that happened? And at what point is the Bible prescribing something to be taking place on a regular basis? And there's a big difference. Okay, and there, between that, there's a big difference. It's one thing to just describe that God did something and it was amazing. It's another thing to prescribe it to say that it must always take place. And the Bible contains both. The Bible contains both. And within the book of Acts, it is indeed also both. Predominantly, it's a narrative that is historically placed in context. So therefore, a lot of it is indeed descriptive. At the same time, there are also expectations that God has upon the church and sermons that are given by Peter and Paul and that events are taking place of which are indeed prescriptive and are expected from the church of today. So we have both in Acts, descriptive and prescriptive. The question becomes, where does the issue of miracles and tongues fall in? Are those descriptive or prescriptive? And we're going to have to go to other passages of Scripture at some point. And when we hit the issue of tongues next week, we're going to be looking at uh, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And we're going to be looking at other passages of Scripture that are not as descriptive, but more prescriptive. And we're going to have to figure out what's going on and put that all in with the story and develop for ourselves, hopefully, a theology, a theological understanding of this issue of miracles. So with that all being said, now that you all have this great illustration, I love carrots. Just, you know, mm, man, you know, it's making me want to go, hey, what's up, doc? You know, it just does. Um, so I just flew. <laughs> I was like, good air. So here's what I want to do to start this off with. 
regardless of where you stand presuppositionally, regardless of where you stand on miracles expected, miracles skeptical, regardless of that issue, one thing is true that, will, that, that both sides have to agree on. Things of the Holy Spirit, the workings and power of the Holy Spirit, are different today than they were in the New Testament. The workings of the apostles and the prophets were very different in the Old and New Testament than what we see as the workings in the church of today. Okay, we, we, we know this to be true. For example, uh, when you look at even the idea of raising people from the dead, doesn't that look different in the New Testament versus today? There was a time in Acts where Paul was preaching, and he, he apparently was a very boring speaker. And as he was preaching, he went on for like four or five hours, and the teenager fell asleep. Well, I'm surprised he stayed that long. But nonetheless, the teenager fell asleep. He was sitting on the second story of, uh, in the windowsill, and he fell out of the window, landed, and fell to his death. Well, that stopped the church service. People quit paying attention to Paul. Paul got up. He goes outside. Doesn't say a thing. Doesn't make a prayer. Doesn't say, God, if it's your will. Doesn't, doesn't say anything about the boy. Just grabs him by the hand, pulls him up. The kid's alive. Paul walks back inside and keeps preaching. Okay, that doesn't happen today. <laughs> okay, it's just not like that. There is nobody that has gone in to a hospital and emptied it. Okay, that just hasn't happened. And so we have to ask that regardless of the point of view you're coming from, if you're going to say that the miracles have stopped, or if you're going to say that the miracles continue, the question is, either way, why have they stopped if they have, or if they have not, why do they look different? Why is it changed? What about it is different? And then we can even ask the sub-question that goes along with it, and that would be, is there a difference between a talent and the gifts of the Spirit? Or are they one and the same? Just one used by God, the other one not. Okay, so there, there's these questions that need to come up. Is there something about the Spirit that will just give somebody a gift that is supernaturally given, or is that just a really well-defined talent that they were just born with? Is there a difference? It, all this plays into this issue. And so, are you ready for the little exploration on this? Some of you are like, eh, whatever, dude, I'm here. And some of you are like, yes, I'm going to jump out of my skin in anticipation. Okay, and, and, and to those people, I'm glad you're here. To the other ones, I hope you get a little more caffeine <laughs> and be, let's be thrilled about this together. So Acts chapter 2, verse 1 starts off, When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all gathered together in one place. Okay, so when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. They were all together, meaning that 120 people that were in the upper room. Now, we have to pause here and talk about this issue of Pentecost and ask ourselves a very simple question like, what on earth is it? Because, you know, Pentecost, is it like a group of people? Like Pentecostals? Is it, that what it is? Is it a one-time day event, like the name that we ascribe to an event that had taken place? And so that Luke is writing Acts saying that, hey, when the day of Pentecost came, he's writing after the fact. He's not writing it as it's happening. Dude, I'm sitting here. It's not like Luke is tweeting, you know. Dude, I think there's a brush of wind right now. Jesus is coming. You know, hashtag Jesus. You know, it, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not what <laughs> Luke is doing. He's writing well after the fact. Okay, so is it that they named it Pentecost, so therefore Luke is just saying, hey, that day, that Pentecost we're talking about? Or you know, just what on earth is it? And come to find out, Pentecost is the Greek New Testament name for the Old Testament celebration of Shavuot. Okay, so in other words, Pentecost is something that happens every single year. It's a, it's a holiday. It's a holiday. Okay, in the Old Testament, it was called Shavuot, or called the Festival of Weeks, or the Festival of First Fruits. Same thing. Okay, so you got the Festival of Weeks, the Festival of First Fruits. They called it Shavuot. You put that into Greek, and they called it in the New Testament Pentecost, because the word literally means 50. So what Pentecost means is 50. Okay, like Penta, Penta, gone, Penta, gram. Okay, Penta, five. Okay, so Pentecost literally means 50, as in the festival that takes place 50 days after Passover. So you have Passover, then 50 days later, you have Pentecost. 
And Flavius Josephus, who is a historian that was employed by a Roman emperor, made the statement that there were actually three Pentecosts every year. There was three separate festivals. There was the festival of wheat, which is great for those with celiac disease. There was the festival of wine, and then there was the festival of oil. Okay, so that he said that you had Passover 50 days later, Pentecost wheat, 50 days later, Pentecost wine, 50 days later, Pentecost oil. That's how Josephus recorded it, the historian that lived during that time period and died not too long after Paul did. Okay, so he lived there, and that's how he described the Jewish testimony or the Jewish festivals on that. So it, it's a pretty strong evidence there. If that is indeed true, Okay, nothing in the Bible indicates three separate Pentecosts. The Bible just says, here's the festival of weeks, festival of the first fruits, and, and it's very possible and likely that they might have increased it because the Pharisees were all about adding to rather than taking away from. So it's very likely they might have taken a day that was supposed to be this one festival and party and increase it to three. You know, I, I don't know of any other churches that try to increase their parties. We definitely don't do that around here. And so it's just, you know, it's like an excuse for a party. And so if this were true, and this is what was happening, then according to what we're looking at in Acts 2, this day that the Spirit comes on Pentecost would have came during the wine Pentecost. Okay, so either it happened at the normal Pentecost or it happened at the second one. So it's either the first or the second. Isn't that great to know? We know it's not the third. <laughs> Okay, but here's the thing that later we're going to see that when the people are speaking in tongues, uh, the, cro <clears throat> the crowd accuses them of being drunk on new wine. And there was not new wine during Pentecost because it was pre that season. There was new wine at the second Pentecost, the Pentecost of wine. At the, that's when all those were harvested and they got the new wine. So therefore, if that statement is to be taken in that way, that we're referring to the second Pentecost. Here's what that means either way. Around that detail, here's what it means. Jesus died, he rose again, and then 40 days later, Jesus ascended into heaven. 10 days later came Pentecost, number one. So either God waited an additional 10 days to send the Spirit, which is curious, why wait 10 days to send the Spirit? The people are gathered, they're praying, they're trying to figure out what God wants to do next, and 10 days they're waiting. Or, if it is indeed the second Pentecost, kind of where I lightly plant my flag, it's in pencil, I'm allowed to erase it and go back to the first one. If it's the second Pentecost, then that means that they waited an additional 50 plus the 10, which is 60 days. Meeting in the upper room, constantly praying, waiting for the Spirit to come. Okay, so either it was 10 days, either it was 50, or 60 days, because 50 days beyond the 10, Either way, the question's still the same. Why wait? Either way, the question's the same. Why wait? Why did God wait? Why didn't God just ascend Jesus into heaven and then send the Spirit? It's not like God is bound by time. He can do whatever he wants, right? He could, he could just, Jesus goes up and goes, hey, Spirit, yes, your turn, tag team, you know, in the ring, bing, you know, it could have been a big WWE event. Then he shows up, fire blazing, let's go, you know, but <laughs> that's not what happened. <laughs> it wasn't a tag team event. Jesus goes up to heaven and says, I'm going to chill for a while. We're just going to enjoy time, 10, maybe 60 days. Then he says, okay, you can go now. You know, it's just, it's weird. So why wait until Pentecost to send the Spirit. That is the part that I had to really, really wrap my brain around because I just, I ask questions like that. Okay, and so I'm looking through my commentaries. They're not being very helpful because people just don't seem to ask questions like that. I almost feel like a child sometimes going up to someone saying, why is this the case? And someone going, good boys, don't ask questions like that. Just go sit down. You know, that's just what I, I, I feel like, you know. And so here's the best I can summarize for you why the Spirit was, why they waited to send the Spirit. Because the Bible doesn't say, we waited because. Okay, God doesn't give that revelation. So I'm going to have to hypothesize. More about Pentecost then. Pentecost, it was a holiday, right? It was a festival that more people attended than Passover. Okay, you would have Jews that would be devout Jews that would go to Passover, then they'd make the trip to Jerusalem again for Pentecost. There are some Jews, however, that would say, eh, if I only can make one, 
I'm going to choose Pentecost because they got inflatables. <laughs> okay, Passover, we just sit down, sing some songs, and have a meal. But Pentecost, that's where the merchants show up. That's where the slides go up. That's where the entertainment happens. That's a party. Okay, it'd be almost like if we were all the, the spread all over the city. <laughs> Okay, in a way that we can only gather so many times because of budget and travel and jobs and everything like that. And we had to choose between a prayer service and a Christmas party. Okay, and if you only could make one, the prayer service or the Christmas party, the average person would say, oh, sure, they might to your face say, I would try to do both because you know, I'm holy and pious. I'd make the prayer. But in reality, and we know this in our past he experience, every time we have a prayer event, like two people show up, but when we have a Christmas party, we get 30, 40, you know, that's for everyone to start you know, bringing their friends. Okay, that, that, gets, that gets a lot of people here. So, uh, so between the two, we know you're going to attend the fun party over the apparently not fun, serious event. Okay, so people traveled from all over the lands, from various countries, all going to Pentecost. And here's what's interesting. At Pentecost, they would meet and start at the temple in the Holy of Holies. And before Pentecost would officially fully begin its big part of the festivities, they would wait until a cloud descended into the Holy of Holies, that'd be the presence of God. He would literally show up at Pentecost. Isn't that great to know you could attend a party and God was there? You know you got a party if the King of Kings shows up, right? You know you got a party. And so God would show up descending into the Holy of Holies, except this year, this year's different. This year in Luke's history, as we're looking over the, what happened with the church, when Jesus died on the cross, what happened to the temple? The earth shook, and the veil was torn, and the Holy of Holies became unusable. So for the first time in the history now of the temple existing, the people are now there, they're getting ready to, to have their party, but God's not showing up. The tent, the, the veil is ripped. The Holy of Holies is, is no longer as pure. It's, it's, anyone can look into it. It's different now. And the cloud, it's not descending. God's presence is not there. And so the people are wondering. People have gathered from miles and miles and miles from all various countries, all gathered together. Almost like if it could be that these people could be converted to Christ, they could all go back and be missionaries, and the message was spread like a wildfire because you got a very diverse group of people. Now we're starting to get to why Pentecost was waited for. Okay, so now all the people are gathered together from various lands, extremely diverse group of people, and nothing's happening. There's no wind. There's no cloud. There's no presence of God. Nothing's happening. But then, verse 2, suddenly, up the street, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying, not just the upper room, but all three levels. The first level, the main level, as well as that upper room where they were staying. And remember, the only access into that upper room is a staircase on the outside of the building, which means this wind came down and just rattled everything. Okay, all levels just rattled. The whole house became filled where they were, stay where they were staying. And tongues like flames of fire... It's not literally a, a burning tongue descending upon them, and it's not literally fire, because otherwise you got a whole bunch of people screaming with their hair on fire, and that just is a whole different scene, okay? People going, ah, ah, okay? It's just not what's happening. Uh, we have to keep in mind that God is often described like a, like a consuming fire that consumes everything, and so, but that's, this isn't consuming like that. It's consuming in a different way. So they're not caught on fire, but they're just trying to describe it with as best pictures as they have available. That's what Luke is doing. So he's like, he's like, you know, it just kind of came, and if you had to put a shape to it, I'd say that looked like a tongue. You know, and I, I admire Luke. It must be his medical background, because when I see a shape of things, even if it looks like a tongue, you have to tell me that first, because my mind does not jump to, that's a tongue. You know, unless you got a face with a sticking out of it, then I'll say tongue. But all by itself, no, no. I'd be like, what is that, a slug? I don't know what that is. Okay, but Luke is, is describing this, and he's saying it's like these, these tongues of fire, 
Okay, and tongues like flames of fire that were divided appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Interesting that they were how many filled? All. Okay, so as far as we can tell, all 120. Which means then, they, check this out, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them the ability for speech. This includes then Mary, the mother of Jesus. It includes the women that were following the people all along the way. It includes, and most people don't think about Mary, the mother of Jesus, speaking in tongues. People just don't think about that because she was there. They were described back in chapter one that she was present. She was there. Okay, so all the people, not just the 12 apostles, not just the 11 plus Matthias. Remember, Matthias replaced Judas because Judas didn't have the guts to be a disciple. Okay. <laughs> you have to go back to last week for that pun. Okay, so they replaced him with Matthias. So now you got 12 apostles again. And they're all the 12 plus the women plus the other people plus the Mary plus Jesus' brothers. Okay, that means you got Judas and you got James and you got all these people are all, uh, you know, Jude, you got all of them, they're just, they're speaking in tongues now. This is a very unique event. Haven't seen anything like this anytime recently either. Okay, I, I have not seen a time or even heard of a time where all of a sudden the entire congregation, everybody began speaking different languages that was unnatural to them. Okay, this, I mean, this is shocking, it really is a shocking event. This would be like suddenly Duck Dynasty speaking in tongues. You know, it's like, I didn't know Uncle Sai even knew Mandarin. You know, uh, it's it just out of nowhere. It's just suddenly they're just like, hey there, get me that turtle. And then rah, 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 they're just speaking off. And, you know, it, it just, we don't know of this happening again. Okay, so this is a very, very special event. Of course, Luke has already filled up enough foundation to indicate for us that this was a very special one-time event. Okay, that this event was special, that the Holy Spirit came in a special way. And now the question remains, has the Holy Spirit stayed in that exact special way, or has something changed along the way? Okay, has something changed along the way? Or the question to ask is, why is it that it appears that the actions of the Holy Spirit differ today than they did back then? Okay, is it that God took the Holy Spirit away? Or if the Holy Spirit is remaining, which by the way appears to be the case, because all are baptized into one spirit and one baptism, that's Paul, Corinthians, okay, and, and, and he just very clearly indicates that the Spirit is present, that when a person becomes saved, that they get filled with the Spirit, that there is that process. So the Spirit's remaining. So if the Spirit has indeed remained, why is it that when people are getting saved and people are getting baptized, that they're not coming out of the waters speaking in different languages like they did in Acts? Okay, I have, I have attended hundreds of baptisms in my life. And I have talked to pastors that have given hundreds of baptisms per week and have done that every week for multiple years. And never once has someone come out of the water speaking a new foreign language. They might come out of the water going, but that is not tongues. <laughs> that is chatter. <laughs> and you're freezing. Okay, it's a whole different thing. But none of them had experienced that. So then the question comes why the difference? What has happened? Is it that they're not filled with the Spirit, or is it for some reason the Spirit behaving in a different way? And if behaving in a different way, why? Okay, what has changed on a very fundamental level if that's the case? And like I said, people, churches fight over this, and they fight over it, and then they give terms, and they throw out words at people, theological terms like, oh, are you a cessationist? saying that all the gifts have ceased? Or are you third wave? Are you charismatic Pentecostal? Are you a continuationist? Or are you, a, and they just throw out all these terms and these words. It's almost like we want to say, are you Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, or Independent? And on and on it goes. And it's like, you know, when you really get down to it, a lot of people are kind of a mix of both, aren't they? They might agree with one over here on some points and agree with the other side over here on other points, and they're not really one over the other, per se. They, they kind of sit somewhere in mutt land. <laughs> it's just where we are. And so, so what has happened? What is going on with the Spirit, and why are things different? So I'd like to look at a couple 
passages of Scripture that we're going to go on an explorational dig together and try to get an answer to this to the best of our ability. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus, and he's talking about the church and about the people of the church. And he says in, 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 in context here that having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. Okay, so when you look at the church, capital C, the universal church, not the local church. Our local church's foundation is concrete, okay, and 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 carpet and flooring okay that's our foundation but for the universal church the foundation of the church is not jesus isn't that interesting jesus is described as what a cornerstone okay and there's two types of cornerstones so people start fighting over which cornerstone it is you got the cornerstone that sits in the corner of a building that makes sure all the walls are straight and at the proper angle but then you got the cornerstone that sits on top of an arch and keeps the arch from collapsing in and holds the support of the roof so which cornerstone are you talking about to which i would say the answer is yes <laughs> okay why not both Okay, it's just the idea is that the cornerstone makes sure that the building is as solid and as a proper direction as it can possibly be. Okay, the cornerstone makes sure that the walls are straight, make sure the ceiling stays up. It is the support network of the building. Okay, and it makes sure that it's aligned appropriately. So that's what Jesus does. Okay, so what has happened then is, is that God, throughout history, starting with Genesis all the way up through the, God, to the Apostle John, writing all the way to the end of, the God, of our, what we have of the Bible, to the book of Revelation, what we got are these 66 books that are the foundation of the faith and the church complete. Okay, you got this as the foundation. It is scripture. It is God revealed revelation. You got the Bible, the writings of the prophets and the apostles. Okay, that's what you got, is that these guys are, people are like, why aren't there prophets in the New Testament? There are prophets in the New Testament. They just go by a different name. They go by apostles. Those are the prophets of old. Okay, and so we got prophets in the New Testament. We just don't call them that because Jesus came and he's the prophet of prophets, the culmination of the prophets. Prophets, capital P. So you don't need more prophets now that Jesus is here. Instead, you have Jesus' apostles or disciples that function like the prophets did of old. And one of the things that, you know, we look at is that, well, let's go to the next verse here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 5 says this, that this was not made known to people in other generations as it is now revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. In other words, it is the Holy Spirit who has been working in both the Old Testament and New Testament, giving the apostles and the prophets their wisdom, their knowledge, and their abilities. In fact, Paul even goes on to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, and he says this very plainly, the signs of an apostle were performed with great endurance among you. Because you might ask, how do you know an apostle true from an apostle false? How can you tell the difference? And so Paul says, the signs were performed among you. Not only signs, but also, what? Wonders and yeah, wonders and miracles. Not just signs, but also wonders and miracles. So here's what is, seems to be taking place. Let me just paint this whole picture for you. God is setting up prophets and apostles to be able to lay the foundation from which the church will eventually be built. Starting with Israel and then later being the church. Okay, that is all being built on this foundation. And those foundations, in order to be able to tell a real one from a false one, that they were given special revelation and special miraculous abilities. So that you would know that this was indeed not just some random Yahoo, that this was someone special of whom God has uniquely anointed for the purpose of revealing God's revelation because they did not have the completed Bible in those days. They only had the writings that were given from God to various prophets, writers, and apostles, right? That's, that's who they were given through. And to know that these writings were appropriate and were from God and not of the other writings that were not from God, how would you know the difference? And part of that answer is because the author is from God through miraculous signs and wonders, 
You got two people that are writing, both claiming to be from God. One guy says, look, I can take a pair of scissors and cut my hair. Now my hair is shorter. Ooh, I'm powerful. And the other one raises the dead. Who are you going to believe? Okay, that's kind of the, the point here. Okay, so this wonders and miracles were designed to help people know that this was God working. This was God's revelation. And Paul was able to raise the dead and heal the sick. And Paul multiple times spoke in tongues because Paul was writing the Bible and lots of it. Other apostles were doing miraculous signs and wonders. People were trying to kill them, and it wasn't working. And it was a miracle what was going on. And sometimes it was working, but God was doing amazing things in the process. Like when Stephen goes to get stoned, and they go to kill him, and they go to stone him, and they throw that stone on his chest, and he's already dead before the stone hits him, and nothing even happened yet. Okay, God just took the spirit from him. So he didn't get to experience a second of that stoning. And people go, wow, what happened with Stephen? He was supposed to suffocate for a while. He was supposed to sit there and choke and spit and blood come out. None of that happened. It just went, and he just laid there. He was already dead. What, what happened here? You know, and it was a miracle. And so miracles happen to show that these people were of God and what they were writing was God's word. Okay, so why have they changed then from today? Because the word is done. Our Bible is completed. We don't have more things to write about. God's revelation was done. So when the last apostle died, when the last apostle died, that would be John. As far as we know, he's the last one to, to, to die. He was exiled on to Patmos. They tried killing him, couldn't do it, so they exiled him to Patmos. And there, they thought that would shut him up because who can he talk to on an island? Lo and behold, comes a letter, <laughs> okay, that goes to all the churches. Amazing, miraculous thing. They just can't shut up the word of God. Okay, so when John died, here's what I am saying happened. The agency of power was returned back to God. I want you to note that wording. This wording will tick off Baptists and Charismatics alike. The agency of power was returned back to God. Here's what's interesting about how the apostles worked is that they did not have to say, if it's God's will, will you be well? They weren't wimpy like that. They did not have to say, if the Lord so chooses. It wasn't a wussy type action that the apostles did. And it was not based upon a person's faith. Many, like the boy that fell out of the window and was dead. He didn't have faith he'd be alive. He was dead. People all around were like, that boy's dead. And Paul didn't say, do you guys have faith that I can raise him from the dead? You ready for a miracle? None of that happened. Paul just went to him, grabbed him by the hand, pulled him up, sat him down, and kept preaching. Okay, it wasn't about faith. Even if somebody lacked faith, miracles still happen, including to them. The healed, people were still healed. Things still happen because it wasn't so wussy as God, if you so choose. Because they had the agency of power. God gave Paul and Peter and James and all the apostles the agency of power so that they could do the miraculous works of God. Okay, and, and we see that all the time in the Old Testament too. You know, there were times that even Moses would just go and just slam a stick into a ground and stuff would happen and he didn't have to say, God, if it's your will, let the waters part if I slam down my stick. I didn't, it was more authoritative than that because Moses was given power. Okay, and we see Elijah being given power and Elisha being given more power than Elijah, though he's less famous for it. Okay, even to the point that there was a seminary for prophets being built and they, were, they had spent all their money into an ax and the ax head had broken off and landed into a river and sunk down to the bottom of the river. And they're like, we're stuck, we're sunk and, and we're, what are we gonna do? And Elijah walks by and looks at it and goes, oh look, you have an ax head and it went in the middle of the river? They're like, yeah. He goes, okay, here you go. And the ax head just floated up to the top. They just grabbed it and 
and kept working. Okay, I mean, it wasn't like he did this whole big long thing. God, if it's your will to let these people do their building of their building, please, God, you have a purpose for them and a plan. Would you please, if you would so be willing, just intervene in some miraculous way and let them be able to get another axe or another building and provide one for them. There was none of that wimpy prayer. Elijah just went, go get it. And the axe had floated like a sponge. And they're like, cool, metal, on water. Oh, look, it still works. And they went and built their building. Okay, it was just, they had power. Unrelenting, powerful power. They had dynamis. We get the word dynamite from it. Okay, that's what they had. They were filled with the dynamis of the spirit, the power of the spirit. When they died, God took the agency of power back. You could almost say that this whole apostles and prophet thing is like Bruce Almighty. Remember Bruce Almighty where God told, where Morgan Freeman plays God and he tells Jim Carrey, Bruce, I'll tell you what, I'll give you all my power. And we say, well, God would never do that. Well, actually, God did do that <laughs> several times. Old Testament and New Testament said, here's all my power, have at it. Not because he's saying you be God for a while. That was just, you know, movie stuff but because he was saying, be my ambassador, be my voice, be my presence, be my hand completely, literally, powerfully in the world and write my revelation as the Holy Spirit reveals it to you and they will know that this is my word because they can't deny what you're able to do. And when they died, God took it back. Now, when God took the agency of power back, here's what it means. Miracles can still happen, but not because of a human. Miracles can still happen, but not because a person, human being, possesses the power to do it. Miracles still can happen because God can choose to intervene in a miraculous way if he so sees fit. But that is his call, not ours. In the New Testament time period, and the Old Testament time period, miraculous intervention was based upon the desire and will of the person who possessed the power. Paul raised some from the dead and didn't raise others because he just chose not to intervene. That was Paul's choice. Okay, Peter chose to speak powerful words to these people and help heal these people, but not those over there because that was the choice. But now it's not a person's choice because the agency of power has transferred. And God now possesses the power. And what we have done is as creative as we can be, being made in the image of God, as God is a healer, so we are able to heal people in the way of medical science and the way that we have developed that and done some amazing things with that. And there are still times that we find ourselves completely at a loss, even in those issues, a.k.a. Ebola, where we find ourselves at our wit's end, might have a cure, don't know, still trying to work with it, still trying to figure that out, might have a vaccine of some sort, help two people. Apparently, it also gives really, really bad um, joint inflammation and potential blindness. So I guess it's better than death. Okay, but we, we're working at it. But see, that's what we're able to do because we're made in the image of God. But we don't have the agency of power. It's been interesting, all these people that are dying, and you see groups of people that say that we have the power, we have the power, but none of them are going to Africa and curing everybody. No one's going to Texas saying, let's go to those nurses and we can cure them. No one's doing that. No one's trying. Okay, because, and we all know, even the ones that go all you know, maniac on everyone, we all know that, the, that something's different, and it's that agency of power. Okay, It's that agency of power that has changed. So why do the actions of the Spirit differ today? Because God's the one that holds the power now, not the people. The Spirit still works in miraculous ways, but it's different. It's different. 
He still works like we looked at when we covered the doctrine of the Holy Spirit several weeks ago. And if you missed that, you get to go to YouTube for that. That's why we did it. Big, long thing, doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And we looked at what the Holy Spirit does in the lives of the Christian and the lives of the non-Christian. We looked at the whole realm of conviction. We looked at the whole realm of regeneration and restoration. We looked at the whole realm of all of that type of stuff. We had a great time with that. But here comes then a different question. If the Holy Spirit has indeed, the agency of power has changed, then what do we do with those gifts? What do we do with the issue of, of, of gifts? And are they different than talents? Or are they the same thing as talents? Or, or what, what's all going on with that? Because we look at, for, uh, in 1 Corinthians, we see the whole list of spiritual gifts. And we see them in other passages as well. You have the gift of prophecy and the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation. And we have all these gifts that are there. And we tend to look at spiritual gifts and we tend to say those are all miraculous things of power. Here's something else that's called a spiritual gift that we just tend to not realize. And what we do, therefore, if we don't get the whole list of gifts together, we don't really look at them from an appropriate point of view. You know what else is called a spiritual gift? In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, Paul says that to some are given this gift and another gift that. Now, it's a very vague. What is this and what is that? The whole context of that passage is marriage. That Paul says that, hey, you know, I know that God has called some people to be married, but I, I hope that they get the calling like I've had, which is singleness. And, and Paul says that, but however, I know that not everyone's called to be single. Some are given this gift of marriage, and some people are given that, singleness. Okay, so it, it's, it's marriage and singleness are both spiritual gifts. And by the way, both are miraculous. It is a miracle watching a marriage happen. It is a miracle that people, two people from different families, unless you're in Kentucky, um, it is a miracle they have two people from different families. <laughs> I'm going to get emails on that. Um, the two people from different families can be raised in different environments that their parents and their grandparents and their grandparents before them all made choices of career and habitation to be able to take a job and move to this state or that state to be able to raise in a certain point of view with a certain type of structure to give the type of experience that would cause a child to be able to grow up with a certain type of personality bent toward a different certain direction that this family would do the same thing that these people between all those choices should just happen to meet and meet at the right time in the right way at the right place that they should actually find each other appealing and attractive that they would actually be able to to unite their lives together in a way that would cause a whole new family to just spring forth okay that is a miracle that really is a miracle. Singleness is a miracle. That a person is able to go through life and be able to find that, that eventual satisfaction and wholeness by serving God in such a way that only single people can. Because I'll tell you the truth, married people are limited in how they can serve God. Single people are literally unlimited. They really, really are unlimited. Because they don't have their minds divided. Their money can go all to their service and their ministry. All they have to worry about is, do they have food or not? And when I was single, I'd be willing to go a day completely without eating if it meant giving my money towards someone else. Or if I just didn't have the money because the choice is made that I couldn't eat, I will go a day without eating. I will not let my, a day go without my wife and my children go without them eating. I will make sure they have food. Okay, that means now that the money that I have available for ministry has become limited. My time, my energy, my energy is different. I know people say, really, your energy's different? You're doing this. When I teach at like Cornerstone or Grace Bible College, or people, students are like, you're like the most energetic guy. You're always, always moving. And I'm, I'm just like, because if I stand still long enough, I'm narcoleptic, okay? My energy's that gone at this point, you know? But I have less energy now. Before, when I was single, Oh boy, I could be at every church event, everything that was happening. I could throw 100% of all I got into it because when I go home and crash, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. Now, that's not the case. I can't throw 100% of my energy into it. I can only throw 70% of my energy into it because when I get home, I got to have at least 30% of my energy left for my daughter, my, my son, and my wife. Okay, and I'll, I'll be honest, that's hard because I'll find myself saying, okay, I gave 70% of my energy to this. Now I come home and my son goes, I need 10%. My daughter goes, I need 30 I only got 20 left. Here you go. Please, Daddy, give me 10 more percent. I just, 
I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I, I'm, you're, you're, I'm physically going to die. Then she finally goes to bed. My wife goes, cool, can I have at least 1%? And I'm like, I'm, my tank, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and we sit down on the sofa, and we watch NCIS, and halfway through the show, I'm asleep. You know, and then she's like, oh, man, really? I'm like, oh, man, yeah, I'm sorry. I just divided my energy wrong. I really did. I got to do it differently. Single people aren't limited like that. They're not limited like that. They can just give to everything, go home and crash. It's no big deal. No one's there is demanding more energy. No one's demanding more time. And so it's a spiritual gift, and it's a miracle. It is a miracle when a single person can do that and just give in to that type of ministry. It's a miracle. I often tell people when you're going to be a missionary, man, don't, don't be married. Don't have kids. Go out there single. Get another single person, same gender, please, and, and go out there and, and serve Christ together and just, just hit the country, hit whatever. It'd be amazing. But if you're bringing a family along with you, you're just dividing all the work up. All the work that you can do, you're dividing up amongst the family. And so they're all spiritual gifts. I hope you can see that. That singlehood and marriage are both spiritual gifts. Paul calls it that. And they're miraculous. And both are powerful. So I want you to see that when we're looking at the idea of spiritual gifts, it's not just this, it's not like the Holy Spirit's giving you something that is going to suddenly you're able, you're an agent of power. The Holy Spirit is doing powerful things in your life that's going to impact the kingdom of God in different ways. And that's what it's about. So are spiritual gifts and talents different? Are they the same? The answer is yes. I love that answer. <laughs> It's yes. As a matter of fact, I even wrote down this other verse that I thought was absolutely phenomenal. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. All abilities come from God. Well, it's not the exact wording. It's a paraphrase, but that's what it's teaching. Okay, all abilities come from God. The text technically says in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, uh, why are you able to boast? What can you boast in that hasn't been given for you? What has been given for you is something you shouldn't be boasting. You should be boasting in God who gave you everything of what you're able to do. Something to that effect. Very long verse, short paraphrase, nice and sweet. All abilities come from God. Whether it's a talent or a gift or whatever, it comes from God. And I understand that there tends to be a, a, a one subtle little difference between the two. A talent is something you're able to do, and that's great you're able to do it. And what you, tends to happen is that talent is usually used to build up one's own kingdom. Spiritual gift is something where the Holy Spirit uses it in a powerful way to build up the church. It's not about building up your kingdom, it's about building up the kingdom of God. And that tends to be where there is indeed a difference. So if you have somebody who can play the guitar, either they can build themselves a career and make an album and have everybody shout their name from a concert, or they can go into a church building and they can lead into worship and help the whole body of Christ praise God in a better way. Okay, one becomes just a simple talent and the other one becomes a gift from the Spirit. The focus difference is that the Spirit is using it to build the church. That's the purpose of spiritual gifts, to build the church. And for some people, their gift that they have been given from the Spirit, some, of, some people, everyone's gifted differently. Everyone's gifted differently. We all look around, we see different abilities all across the spectrum. And everyone keeps going, well, what's my gift? Well, what's my gift? How am I gifted? I don't think I have any. To which I would reply, it's because you're looking in the wrong direction. If you keep asking what your gift is, what God is doing for you, your focus is on you. And spiritual gifts don't focus that way. Instead, the focus needs to be, look at the church and ask, where is the church weak? Where is the church struggling? Where are people suffering? Where are people having a hard time? Where are people in the darkest moment? How is the church crumbling? How is it hanging by a thread? And what possibly could be done with th that could fix that? Is there a way that I might be able to help it hold on, to help someone persevere, to help someone have encouragement? Could maybe God use me in that way? Now your focus is not on how are you gifted, but your focus is on how are people hurting and how can God use you to help them? Then you will start finding your gifts. Then you will start finding your abilities. As long as your goal is to Honor God and build his kingdom, not your own. 
not your own. Some people tell me I have the, and I, and I believe I have it, the ability to, to speak, the ability to teach, and sometimes the ability to be funny. I say sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I'm not as funny as I think I am, and sometimes I'm more funny than I realize, and sometimes, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Apparently that was funny. <laughs> and so was that. <laughs> and that. I had no idea the word that could be funny. Okay, you know, so sometimes that happens, okay? Now, I, if you were to look at my childhood, never in the wildest imagination would that ever be dreamed that I would be able to stand in front of people because I was hyper shy and hyper quiet in front of people. Hyper shy and hyper quiet. I did not entertain people. I entertained my mom, almost to the point of death. <laughs> I entertained myself at her expense. Whole different issue. Okay, but I did not entertain people. I did not do drama. I did not do theater. I couldn't do that. Every time a teacher gave us do a, a presentation, I was always this, you know. Now, I don't want you to see the paper shaking, so that's why I set it down. Uh, but I was always, I would just read from my notes. And that's how I was. So how did this happen? And I'll be honest with you. This is one of the areas in my life where I've, I've done many mistakes in my life. I've done many sins in my life. I've done many mistakes even just yesterday. Okay, so I'm not a perfect person. I, I'm not a sinless person. And I'm not trying to <laughs> boast in being a great person. I just wanted to point that out. There was a couple of choices that were made well. And those choices were that there was a time that I was in a youth group that someone said, we are going to go on a mission trip. We want our whole class to go on the mission trip. Do you want to go too? And I went, yes, I'll go too. And so we all, a group of us went. There was like eight of us that went on this mission trip and we ran the backyard Bible club for one day and one day only and it went for six hours. It was a great time, loved it, so much fun. On our way up, the uh, youth leader, he got some sickness in his throat and had the type of laryngitis and couldn't speak. And so they said, we need someone to speak for us a lesson. And they looked at me because I was the only one that was an 11th grader. I was the oldest one in the group. And they said, would you be willing to do this? And I, I just said, you know, I, I, my whole prayer was, God, I just want to do what you want me to do. However I can help, I want to help. And then on that car ride, they said, would you do this? And I went, okay. And so I sat there trying to figure out what I'm going to do and how this is going to go. And, and I got up and, and I spoke. And I spoke about Jesus. I spoke about the Bible. And I used illustrations from Disney cartoons and everything. I'm just pulling off. I'm throwing this. When it all got done, I, I get home. And then the next Sunday, the pastor comes up to me and he says, I heard that people really liked your talk and that there's a little preacher inside of you. So I want you to preach Sunday nights from now on. And if you don't preach Sunday night, there won't be a service because everyone will gather and I'm not going to be prepared. <laughs> so you're preaching. And so I started preaching Sunday nights. And it was, didn't know. Didn't even ask, God, am I gifted at speaking? It just kind of got thrusted on me. Just kind of got thrusted there. And that's how I think that gifts are supposed to work that there's a weakness in the church, there's a moment of problems that's there, and somebody is used to help. And that becomes their ability. And that becomes their gift, that the Spirit used them to help a ministry that was hanging by a thread to persevere, to not break, to not fall apart, but to keep the gospel going. So don't sit down and ask, God, how am I gifted? How? Instead, look around. How is the church broken? and try to fix it? How are people hurting? And try to encourage them. How is the gospel not being shared? And share it. How are people being silent and the word is not being presented? Then present it. Where are people that are just down and they don't have? And if you do, you might be able to provide. Your gifts will arise in that. It will start as a spark and may the church fan that with you into a flame. And may that flame be a consuming fire in your life and in the life of the church that it becomes a bonfire for the kingdom of God. That's being moved by the Spirit. It is powerful. It is unmissable and unavoidable. May you be empowered for our church and for the kingdom of God today.
have a word of prayer.